Today, it's time for expressions, as in faces, for the pocket knot. This is part two of a two-part series on making the injection molds for this toy for the craftsman, which is called the pocket knot. In the previous episode, and I'll put a card up above, I made the mold for the body. And so in this episode, I'm going to make the fold for, mold for the face, which is just uh, kind of hard to get out, but it's a snap-in, snap-out face. So I can just snap it back in as the craftsman demonstrated. The machine behind me is the machine that I'm going to be using for this one. This is uh, my go-to machine. Uh, it's a smaller machine than the one I used in the last episode, but it gives me higher injection pressure. Plus I have this uh, nice uh, pneumatic hydraulic clamp uh, with a lever that makes it really nice for production. Now one thing that I haven't commented on, you'll notice that there's this uh, hose in the back which is currently attached to the other machine. I use that to extract the fumes that come out from off-gassing when melting the plastic because it's really good to try to keep the fumes out of my workshop. And so I just move that extractor from one machine to another. Let's head to the computer and I'll show you what I got from the craftsman and take you through the process of making the molds and then making the first test parts. The craftsman sent me the faces as a step file, uh, which you can see here. Now, the interesting thing about a step file is that, well, actually that doesn't show it, but if we take a look, there are several things about it. One is that it's multiple bodies, and each of the bodies is just half of the face. The other thing is, if I show the origin, you can see that these are not very close to the origin. So I typically like to do several things before I make use of these in an injection mold. Before we get to that, I just want to mention a few things that I noticed about this. The first thing is that we have faces on one side, and then we have faces on the other side as well. Let me hide the origin again. And that means I thought that there were a total of eight combinations. What I didn't realize until I watched his video, and actually I was a little confused about it, I was wondering which orientation is up. Is it this orientation, or is it this orientation? And it turns out the answer is yes, and as a result, you get a total of 16 combinations. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these so that when I have two different bodies, like this one is body 8 and body 6, we have a single body. And that's what these operations are here. So if you look, you'll notice that the number of bodies decreases as soon as I move forward, like so. And when I move forward all the way, it reduces from 8 down to 4. And so now you can see each of these has both the top and the bottom half as a single body. The next thing that I'm going to do is I actually create a sketch that I'm going to use to align these to the origin. So I'll show the origin again. And then this is moving them so that it's these are all centered on the origin. And then the final thing that I like to do is convert each of these bodies, let me hide the origin again, into a separate component. And the advantage of making them separate components is now I can move them independently, which is something that I want to be able to do when I design the mold. I imported that into a new file that is uh, for the mold. And the first thing I did is I set up a sketch. The purpose of this sketch is to move these around to get what I think will be kind of a uniform flow. So the idea is that I want these, if you look at here, at this one and this one, the idea is that this length from here to the gate and then this length from here to there is about the same. So that, in other words, the flow distance is the same for all four of the faces, which is what results in this layout here. So I set up the sketch to have all of those locations, and I also set up the sketch for a two and a half inch tall mold that can be reduced in size to two inches, which is the final size that I'm going to deliver to him. And then I'll make the sketch visible so you can see what's going on. And these are the locations where I want to move each of the faces. And so if I move forward one operation at a time, you can see each of the faces moving into those locations that I wanted. And now this has the setup that I want. The next step is I usually add a component, which is the core or cavity. 
and then I make the mold blank for that. And this was based on the same sketch, as you can see there. Then I go ahead and I start to make the runner and gates, etc. So here I've, I've added the gates. And then I'll add the ball at the end of the runners. And then I go ahead and add the runners. Now at this point, these are all the same diameter, which is not exactly what you want. You want uh, the section up here where they are combined to have the same cross section as all four of these combined, which we'll have. But the first thing I want to do is mirror these. And then here is where I added the section. So the cross section here is enough, basically four times the cross section of any one of these. The cross section here is twice the cross section of each of these. And the idea behind that is you'll get pretty much the same velocity of flow as the size reduces. So how fast the plastic moves here will be the same as how fast it moves through here and here and then through here. And then I want to smooth this out a little bit for the plastic so it's not a sudden change. So I had to fill it there. And then to make it easier to mill, I add a round end here. And this, by the way, is something known as a cold slug. So the idea is that when you first inject plastic, the very first piece of plastic might be a little bit colder than the rest, and so it ends up here. And then you have the rest of the molten plastic in there. So that's uh, most of the important details. I'll zoom forward to the end. And there are a few changes that you saw me make. They're not that important in terms of the behavior. But I added the holes for the alignment pins. These are quarter inch pins that are used to make sure that the two mold halves line up correctly so that you get the minimum shift and parting line possible. Ideally, no shift at all. And then these are in here so that if this is difficult to take apart with your fingers, you can use a screwdriver to pry it apart. I always put this into a mold because I'm never sure before I make the mold whether that's going to be an issue or not. Sometimes it isn't, in which case these are superfluous, but for other times it's good to have these in case it's really hard to get the mold halves apart. So let me hide the runner and the parts now, and this is the finished mold design ready for me to start milling. The other half looks pretty much the same, so if I show that, it's different because the faces are different on this side, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. Something I did not cover in the previous video is what's involved in setting this up so that you can actually cut the, the molds. And so there are a number of operations here that are used to actually cut them. So here, this is the, let's see, I forget which it is. Okay, that's the core. And these are all the different operations that are involved in actually cutting it. So we start out by probing, which you'll see soon. We face it off to get a nice smooth surface. Drill the spot holes, which is to ensure that when I use the drill, it does the drill itself doesn't wander. I drill all the way through. And then I come back with an end mill to open up these alignment holes. Bore them out to final dimensions. And then I cut the pockets that are used for the screwdriver. I use adaptive milling with a small cutter. This is a 3 inch flat end mill, so it's moving, removing a little bit of the material, but not a lot. Then I come back with some rust machining with a 1 inch diameter end mill to remove more of the material. This is a flat bottom end mill, so it's going to be a rough finish. I come back with a 1 inch diameter end mill to cut away the, a lot of the material for the runners. And then this is a contour with a 1 16th inch ball nose end mill that I use for cutting the smooth surfaces that are curved. And that includes both the runners as well as the main part of the face. 
that doesn't completely clean it up because um, this strategy of, you know, the first strategy is good for surfaces that are vertical, but surfaces that are more horizontal, I have a second strategy that helps clean up some of the material that was not removed by the first strategy. Then I come back with the really small 1 32nd inch ball end mill to clean up the areas around the parts of the face, the, the expression, because those are small detailed areas. Another strategy which is using the same end mill to try to clean it up even more. And then a final strategy to clean up the gates. So one thing I'm noticing is that there are some streaks of uh, black in here. And I did a thorough purge on this, but then I shut this uh, machine down and then I started up again. So it looks like there's some black that uh, still needs to be purged. So I'll run this through a few more times and see, whoops, I forgot to put more plastic in. So this will probably be a short shot. Uh, this particular part uses um, close to the full shot size. Uh, actually it didn't, and uh, there's still a little bit of black there, but uh, it's not too bad. So to get it out, I just kind of wiggle it, and then it pops out. Oh uh, yeah, and there's some black streaks there as well. Now I'm using this, I'm using this to, to fill it rather than uh, the hopper, just because I'm not making that many shots. And so it takes a little bit of work to clear out the hopper uh, and change colors. So that's why I'm doing that. Okay, yeah, this is looking better. I'm not seeing any streaking on this. There's a tiny bit there, but it looks like if I take a few more shots, it should be completely gray. Oh, uh, yep. A uh, tiny bit of uh, black there, but yeah, after doing a few more shots, it should be uh, completely gray. Yeah, still a little bit of uh, black right there. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, a little bit there as well. So I'll keep, just keep at this for a little bit longer. So you can see I've been a little bit busy here. This is uh, what it looked like before I did a purge. So you can see that there was a lot more of the dark material coming out. And then after doing a purge, I didn't get it all out. You can probably see a little bit there, but it's a lot better than it was before I did the purge. So it just means I wasn't patient enough uh, to be able to do a complete purge. Now, these are the runners and the gate, and they're really easy to cut off. I typically use these side cutters, and as you can see, it's just a matter of positioning it the way you want, 
giving it a quick snip and then it's actually a pretty clean cut. So those are e really easy to cut off. Likewise, let me pick a good one here. These are also quite easy to cut off. So I'll go and get it cl really close there and then give a snip. And now the fun part, which is these snip these clip in here. Uh, I don't know if that's right side up or upside down, but you get the idea. And so it's easy to take these out, flip it over, and now you've got another face. So this project was really fun. Uh, these are the two molds I'm going to be sending off. This is the one for the faces that you just saw. I do need to cut this a little bit shorter for him because he has a smaller vise than I have. Uh, and then this is the other mold here. And the challenging part, as you saw, is getting this undercut in there, which is the part that holds the face into place. And you saw how I did that by using an insert. The final thing I want to do is, these are just a push fit, and I want to put a little bit of uh, Loctite on them so that as the aluminum heats up and expands, it will expand faster than the steel, so I want to make sure they don't fall out. But other than that, they're ready to send off. Now one thing that some people asked me in my previous video is why did I not put vents into the injection mold? And that's a really valid question. Vents are an important thing in a lot of molds. I have found that with many molds on these desktop machines, probably because of the low clamping force, the vents are a lot less important. And what I mean by that is with higher clamping forces, you really do have the surfaces uh, be between the two mold halves sealing very effectively to keep the gases from escaping. But with these lower clamping forces on these desktop ma machines, my belief, and I'm not sure about this, is that it allows the gases to escape uh, in all directions. The other thing that is different between these small machines and the industrial machines is the injection pressure that these machines can achieve is a lot lower than you can achieve in the larger machines. And so when you have much higher injection pressure, you're going to be increasing the pressure of the trapped gas or air quite a bit more, which can lead to burn marks, etc. And I don't think these machines are capable of that high pressure. So that's why I don't have vents on these two molds. Should I have put vents on them? Yeah, probably should have because it doesn't hurt. Uh, but as you, can, as you saw, it didn't prevent filling the molds. So not having vents for these particular molds was not an issue. This was, as I mentioned in my previous episode, a really fun collaboration with the craftsman. It was quite enjoyable. I was also quite pleased for the craftsman to see that he sold out within hours of his first run that he thought was way larger than he thought they sh he needed to have for the first run. So I think that's really great and I'm happy for him. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed this project. Please help me grow the channel by subscribing, give me a thumbs up, commenting below. And then finally, I would like to thank my patrons. I got a few new patron supporters on Patreon this last video. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.